Hello everyone and welcome to an extra special video. With the help of the amazing people over at the American Heritage Museum, I was able to record an exclusive interview talking about their current restoration project of a Panzer I. In just a little bit, you'll get to see the full interview, but before we jump into that, I thought it would make sense to just briefly discuss the history behind the tank. I'm not going to go too in-depth into it because I'll be doing that in a future episode of Forged for Battle. But think of this as a brief summary so you understand some of the reasoning behind why the tank is the way it is. Trust me, you aren't going to want to miss any of the information in this video, especially if, like me, you live in the northeastern US, so bear with me for a minute. The Panzer I, as the name suggests, was the first production tank used by the German army in the Second World War. Although there were a few designs before it, those only saw limited production compared to the over 2,000 Panzer I's built by the end of its run. Following trials in 1934, the tank was originally designated as SDKFZ-101 when production began. The name we know it by today would come two years later in 1936. Keep in mind, this is prior to Hitler beginning his aggressive conquest of territory that would come later in 1938 with the annexation of Austria, so when development and construction began, Germany was still under the constraints of the Versailles Treaty. To get around this, they built the tanks initially by referring to them as so-called Kleintraktor, or light tractors. In fact, the first 15 were delivered without turrets and used for training. Throughout the war, there would be a total of four main production variants of the Panzer I, not including command vehicles or other uses of the chassis. If you saw the most recent Curse by Design, you'll have seen one of the last and most bizarre versions of this tank, known as the Panzer I Ausf F. Regardless of variant, these tanks would see use throughout the entirety of the war, first seeing combat in the Spanish Civil War where they fought against the Soviet T-26. Spain must have really liked the tanks following this, or just been too cheap to buy new tanks, because Panzer I's in Spanish service wouldn't be replaced until 1954 when they purchased some M47s. I would have hated to be the tankers assigned to those tanks had Spain been forced into battle against any other nation before then. Although these tanks were, with few exceptions, only armed with machine guns, they fit perfectly into the Blitzkrieg doctrine Germany used during the early stages of World War II. The maneuverability, and especially the radio each tank was equipped with, allowed Hitler to quickly gobble up territory. Even after their descendants like the Tiger and Panther entered the battlefield, these small little tanks served as reliable scouts up till the end of the war. That's more than enough backstory though. Please enjoy this exclusive interview on the only Panzer I that will be on public display in the United States. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I am here today at the American Heritage Museum with Dick and we are going to be talking about their restoration of the Panzer I that they have in their collection. So if you want to go ahead and give us a little bit and just kind of walk us through what you guys have done with this thing. Right, well, uh, back in 2013, I went to work for the Colleagues Foundation at the uh, Littlefield Collection in Portola Valley, California. Uh, they had a very extensive uh, uh, collection of tanks and various uh, World War II and other wars artifacts. And uh, in their collection was this very rare Panzer I, um, which was, it had just a very rough cosmetic restoration at the time. And uh, after the auction of all the equipment in, that we had out there uh, at the Littlefield Collection, we sent this particular tank to a master restorer in uh, Reno, Nevada. And he was very well known and well renowned for particularly German vehicles. And quite a ways through his restoration, he unfortunately passed away. And it was decided then to go back and retrieve the project and bring it here to finish the restoration in our shop here in Stone, Massachusetts. Um, like everything else, it's, it's when somebody takes something apart and then it becomes somebody else's job to put it back together. Uh, it, it gets a little frustrating at times. So many parts had to be remanufactured and produced here in Stowe. And the other thing is we, we keep getting answers from the grave. Uh, we'd look at something and say, why on earth did he do this like this? And then as we put it together, it's, ah, now this makes sense. Um, and the other thing we found too is that when we received this back, it looked like it was pretty well together, but it wasn't. It was what we call dry fit. I mean, he'd make a part, he'd put it on loosely, he'd make final adjustments and things like that. Well, we got it before any final adjustments were made. So we had to go back through and almost disassemble all of his work to be sure everything was, it had the cotter pins in it, it was tight, it's ready to go. Things like the final drive and control differentials, uh, they weren't shimmed. It was just bolted in there without the shims, which isn't going to work. Um, 
and then finding other parts, like the drive shaft parts, stuff that he'd sent out to have machined. We don't know where that went. So we're backtracking and trying to make parts. We've had to make a lot of things for this. Um, but as you can see, it's come a long ways. So we're very close to starting it. Uh, today we'll have the, uh, the oil pressure is up. We'll have fuel pressure up this week. Uh, we sent the magneto up for rebuild because it was nobody home there. Yep. And we hope to have it this week. And uh, I would say the end of next week, this will be running and driving. The only yeah. one in the world. Yeah, because while I was waiting for you to get back, I was just kind of looking over the thing. And I got to say, it's just, it's an absolutely beautiful restoration because you see a lot of the pictures and some of the ones that are left of these things, it's just a rusted turret mounted on some bunker somewhere. But this thing, it looks like it rolled right off the factory. Right. We have to give that to Greg Taylor, the man who unfortunately died in the middle of the project, is he was a perfectionist. Yeah. And everything he did had to be perfect or not at all. So that helped us a lot. I mean, it didn't help us as far as finding the parts and pieces, but everything he did was done correctly and perfectly. And so I, I had asked you before we started, and you said you didn't know too much, but do you want to just kind of let us know what the general history that we know of this tank is? Right. What I found out from different people, and you, and you get a lot of stories. You, mm -hmm. you have to sort out which one is the right one and who's, you know. But what I did find out is that this come from a, a Canadian uh, museum. I'm not sure which one, but I do know that Jacques Littlefield traded five other tanks for this one. So he must have wanted it pretty bad. And I guess it's, this is only one of a few in the world. And again, it's the only one that's going to run and drive. So that's, I don't know too much other, about the history other than that. Do you know if the uh, museum has managed to find any pictures of this specific tank from back in the war? Or we just don't no, really know? No, we don't know because this one was very early in the war. It was in the, the Polish campaigns like that. All the pictures that we found, there's no vehicle numbers like Tank 41, Tank 32. Yeah. Other German stuff did. Every picture we found, there is no numbers. In fact, in this one, there's no unit markings. So it's hard to tell what's what. And the pictures are all were taken by Germans, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, so the answer to your question is, no, we don't have a clue. Well, that, that <laughs> actually is uh, pretty relatable, because I just did a thing on my channel where we were trying to locate a specific tank that was in a photograph. Mm -hmm. and without the markings on it, because it was early in the war, it was nearly impossible. There's no unit markings, there's nothing. So it's you're trying to piece together something that you just know absolutely nothing about. But we think we were able to actually locate that one. So uh, if anybody thinks they know anything about this, do leave that in the comments. It might help these guys out here. Maybe we can find a photo of this thing and they can put it along with the exhibit when it debuts in uh, May. Is in I May, heard. yeah. And like I said, this did come from a Canadian museum. So maybe someone out there had visited this museum at some time, and this might have been on display. All of that would be very helpful. Yeah, so if uh, any of you guys remember seeing this maybe years back when it was in Canada and you have any information, do let me know or I'll leave the contact information for the museum and you guys can uh, let them know if, if you work at one of the museums there and if, remember this thing being there because that would be a very nice addition to this. I know you guys have the, uh, the Stug outside. Right. You have a photograph of it actually in the Correct. war. And it's, right. those little bits of history really help kind of just show you how far these things have come. Because sure. this is a tank, but when you know the history behind it, it becomes more than just a tank. It gives it personality. You know, it was there. It, it, it brings it almost alive. This was yeah. really there, you know. And in this case, uh, we know this one went a lot of miles. I showed you the gas pedal with the corner worn right off. Yeah. That takes a lot of miles for somebody's hobnail boots to wear the side off of that. Um, some of the track links we found were very, very badly worn. Mm -hmm. and that all shows a lot of mileage. So yeah, that wherever this thing was, it was well used. I know you were showing me over on the uh, the engine deck over there that it has the added on plate on the top as right. well as those little fender mm -hmm. flares on the back. Right, that, that was added. a field modification. And you can tell by the welding, it was yep. done in the field. So, but uh, yeah, these were in use for a long time and uh, they were underpowered. Like I said, that's why this one has the Krupp engine. It was later on when they went to the to the 1Bs, um, they went with the Maybach water-cooled engine, which mm -hmm. is a much more successful application. And whenever you see these, any pictures of these where they're using them, you'll see that all the air ventilation uh, hatches and all those things are open because they were underpowered and they were always running hot because they're underpowered. And uh, with the water-cooled Maybach, they solved those problems. Yeah, so. that, that was even an issue with the original tanks during World War I. So it's not too surprising that a basically interwar tank here would have pretty right. similar issues. Right. Yeah, well, we're very proud of it. Uh, we can't wait to, to get it on display. And, uh, but it's like I said, it's going to be running and driving. And it's like everything else here at the Collings Foundation and the American Heritage Museum. 
they, they pride themselves with everything runs. They don't like static displays. They want stuff to run and drive and have people hear it. We call squeaking and clanking. Here are yep. the tracks and here are the <laughs> engine and all that. That's all part of it. Yeah, because you, you, you were telling me about the uh, the IS2 that you guys did right. and some of the things you had to do. You said it was a, even more difficult than this project. So. The IS2 was a big problem, but it was a much bigger tank. Yeah. This one, we don't have just to get inside of this. I'm a big guy. So I have to find people that can actually get in there and do these things. So it was it was a project. Yeah, I'd imagine this is a little more similar to working on like a car as opposed to working on right the IS2 that's the size of a bus. Right, and there's a, a <laughs> lot of components in a very small space. And the more you get it together, the smaller the space gets. And that's where we are now. So, but uh, other than that, that's all I can really tell you about it. Well, another question kind of not related to this specifically, but a lot of people had asked, do you have any idea why it would be that the Panzer I is almost kind of a forgotten tank during the Second World War when you have tanks like the Panzer II, III, and IV that are just, everybody knows about those, but not a lot of people talk about this one. Well, this was so early in the war that they didn't have a lot of real machinery. Mm -hmm. Then when this guy came out, they were chasing people on horses with spears and axes and things like that. They didn't need a lot of armor. It wasn't very fast. Um, so I think as production came up and their, um, their new designs came along, that this was just obsolete so fast. Yeah. And shortages of steel. A lot of them might have been cut up for scrap and reprocessed. Um, and then a lot of these were sold to other countries and used for other purposes. Yeah, because we, we were kind of talking about it earlier, and you were saying there, there's only like, what did you say, like three of these type left in the world. I think there's I like so. seven Panzer ones of all variants left in the world. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you guys have one that's running and in this condition is, I mean, th this collection here is, I would say, almost unlike any in the world. There's very few museums that can even right. come close to this one. Sure. And the way everything is displayed here, yeah. a lot of museums, things are in lines. Mm -hmm. The worst thing they do is they'll take from the earliest to the latest in one line. Very boring. Yeah. This kind of shows it like it really was done with the lighting and the, the way they've gone about this. You're right. There's another, not one other place in the world like this. Yeah. And you've got some things that are unlike any other museum. Like we were talking about the Ho Row and you were saying if you want to kind of go through the story of that. I know some people really like the Ho Row in my yeah. community. So if you want to kind of tell a little bit about that, maybe we can do a separate video on that in the future. But yeah, if you want to just give a yeah, months. that was uh, that was on Clark Field in the in the Philippines, and uh, from what I've been told about this, it was set up in an area where they had a smoke generator running, and this particular one took out five Sherman tanks before they were able to capture it, and it's been told to me that a platoon went around the corner behind the smoke and they 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 attacked it from the rear and got rid of all the, the crew that was on it, and it sat in the jungle for 80 years, and it ended up at the uh, Marine Corps Museum in Virginia. And they've been grateful enough to, to loan it to us. So, and we're going to leave it just like it is in the mm -hmm. patina. It, it shows nice like that, just just the way it sat in the jungle. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I don't want to take up too much because I know you guys still have a lot to do to get this thing done. And the, what's the date that you guys have right now for when you want to debut this? It's going to be early May. Okay. I don't have the exact date on that. That's something upstairs can help you with? I believe Hunter had said something about, I, I, I'll, I'll double check with him and I'll put it in the description. He was saying something about, I think May 14th or 15th was the day he said. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are in the area and you come down, I believe, and it could change, but I think you'll be able to see this thing actually running and driving. So That's the plan. If, if you want to see that, and I will try to be here. So if you want to meet me and see this, then uh, try to be there. I'll, I'll be sure to tell you guys the exact date. So thank you very much for the time and uh, be sure to come and visit this museum and see this thing when it's on display. All right. Well, thanks for coming back.